So um, I might ask first, you know, what's a model for change? A model for change is a framework that allows for complexity. So, you know, in the book, I talk about going to the beach. Uh, one of my favorite beaches to go to is Figure Eight Island in North Carolina, where I live. And uh, there's this one place where the intercoastal waterway opens out, you know, onto the ocean. And so you're walking on this beautiful, pristine beach and the swells come in at regular intervals. You know, it's formed by the intersection of, you know, the, the ocean current and the wave. And this produces these beautiful, regular swells. But when tide is falling and you walk up to the inlet, there the current is rushing out and it's encountering these otherwise regular swells. And the result is just a complete chop. Now, the surface is very messy and choppy, but there are only three simple forces that produce that. It's current, it's the regular ocean current meeting the tidal current meeting the wind. And this produces that. So what I've attempted to do is find a simple way to explain something that is manifested in a complicated way. Also, uh, would it be helpful if I go through that? Absolutely, let's do that. Let's go into the slides then. So, um, okay, so. So, so that's, the, that's the threefold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, might, might be helpful to just kind of go through this. So if we look at change between the 16th and 18th century, the best way to understand it is in terms of the ongoing interaction of these three levels. Now, the first of these levels is practically pan-universal. It, it, it's, it's shared by many of the world's sophisticated musical cultures. And that is a distinction between scalar and melodic understandings of mode. If you think about it, uh, you know, whether it's ragas or makams, or the eight modes of Western polyphony, there's a pole of melodic predetermination. You've got your octave species or your scales on one side, which are synchronic. They exist in a one-dimensional, non-chronological way. They may reflect an underlying mathematical order. And then at the other end of the pole or of the continuum of melodic predetermination, you have tune. And the tune goes like this. And when you have formulas, whether that's a raga or whether that's a psalm tone, it's a, it's, it doesn't behave always exactly the same way, but it follows a certain set of behavioral norms which can be statistically quantified, which have phenomenological implications for how we expect and hear things. And so mode unfolds then on that continuum. And that's already present in the ancient Greeks. Uh, so when you move forward then... In so there's the, no five chord to the one chord, and <laughs> there's no four going to the five in these cultures. Not, not yet, not yet. Okay, so if you move into the Middle Ages then, <laughs> in the Middle Ages, if Franz Viering has done really important work on this, he identifies three terms that are used for mode. You've got modus, you've got tonus, and you've got tropus. Tropus falls out of use in the, in the Renaissance, and we're left with modus and tonus. So modus becomes strongly associated with the modes of the philosophers. That is to say, the musicus, the theorist, who on the basis of monochord analysis and ratios, math, concludes that these are the modes, these are the notes of music. And of course, division of the monochord into all of its super, super fine uh, distinctions is, of course, the basis of Greek music theory, ancient Greek music theory. Um, so modus is associated with the classical tradition. On the other hand, the practical church musician is very much concerned with tonus. What does a cantor need to know? The cantor, in starting with the earliest tonaries before music is even notated, they need to know what's the last note and what psalm tone do I use? So that's tonus, and it's a how it goes. It's an experiential understanding of mode. So modus of the philosopher, tonus is associated with the churchman, the cantor, the practical. Modus tends to be prescriptive in the sense that it's abstract and it moves into the particular. Tonus tends to be descriptive. It ends on D 
it has a plagal range and uh, that's what I need to know and it's experiential. So modus and tonus, one is loosely associated also then with prescriptive and the other with descriptive. So that's the Middle Ages. And as a result of that, in the Middle Ages, you know, people like John Cotton, Johannes Septimensis, many other theorists come up with things like credential norms, typical first starting note, all the things a cantor needs to know. Hmm. And we have these two traditions. Now, by the late Middle Ages, theorists are starting to think already about, well, what does this mean for polyphony? So when you get to the Renaissance, especially to people like Gafurio and Tinctoris, they start to apply mode to polyphony. And as that develops then over the course of the next century, and people like Aron, um, um, they begin to, and Aron is especially important in this, is how do, how do we apply parameters of mode from plain chant, which include especially final, ambitious, cadential hierarchies, sometimes typical melodic gesture. Uh, how do we apply that to polyphony? And so new parameters become important. One parameter that becomes important is the interrelation of adjacent voice parts. So that, for example, if the tenor is authentic, the alto will be plagal, and the bass will be plagal, and the superiors will be authentic. So the interrelation of the vocal polyphonic complex Another thing that becomes really important is uh, polyphonic cadential hierarchies. Cadential hierarchies are part of plain chant, but they take on new meaning in the contrapuntal context where they're defined through contrapuntal, uh, in their co contrapuntal instantiation. And then another thing is imitation. If you're going to have imitation, uh, you know, the whole doctrine of imitation, for example, you have a fifth in the subject is answered by a fourth in the answer. Th that develops as an extension of modal theory. So that's our second level. The first level, modus tonus, originates in the Middle Ages and continues throughout the whole time. The second level originates in the early Renaissance, and that's polyphonic as opposed to specifically monophonic parameters of mode. And then the third level is the influence above all of the keyboard. Because as long as you are not composing in reference to the keyboard. Yeah, the keyboard might be, it was frequently used to um, support vocal polyphony. Oh, but so subsequently, you know, with the fall of the Western Empire, that kind of went away, but the, the Byzantines held on to that. So the Emperor Pippin, there's a couple of occasions when Byzantine emperors around the year 1,000, 900, 1,000 in the Carolingian period, give uh, Pippin and Charlemagne uh, gifts of organs. And these would have been incredibly beautifully crafted. We have descriptions of them. Um, and then, you know, one of the popes writes a letter to an abbot saying, you know, here's this organ. It's really, the organ is really important as a teaching tool. By about the year 1000, virtually every major cathedral and every major abbey had an in situ great organ. And this doesn't count. 1000. Like the year 1000, right? Oh, wow. that's, that's pretty early. early. That's very <laughs> yeah. early. We have none of the music. We don't know anything about the music. We, it just begs the question because we don't really, it's not really till about the 1200s that we first start to see the first intimations in, in uh, Latin theory sources about the possible influence, possible conjectural, possible influence of the keyboard as an instrument of reference. Because short, we're very familiar with the monochord. But they're living, they're coexisting with organs for a long period of yeah. time. There's no evidence that they were collaborating with voices. Like, we don't know. Maybe they were, but we don't have, don't have much information about that. But the idea that the organ gradually becomes a referent for tonal space uh, increases throughout the Middle Ages. It definitely seems to be at work by the 14th century. And then in the 15th century, it starts to become more explicit. By the late 16th century, fast forwarding, it is the norm that vocal polyphony is supported by the organ, usually playing um, uh, basso seguente. We don't yet have basso continuo. So my second book, I look at basso continuo sources and the development from basso seguente to basso continuo. And what's happening there is crucially important. The notational conventions of Renaissance polyphony are driven by the intersection, by the fact that you've really only got two transposition levels available. 
contus durus, which is a blank signature, and contus molus, which is a flat signature. And then the modes can be transposed. Really, those represent complete um, transpositions of the entire system of modes. The whole, if, if you think of as Harry uh, Harry Potter, Harry Power used the uh, analogy <laughs> of a flotilla of boats, or maybe it was Margaret Bent. You know, they all rise and fall hmm. based on which contus you're in. So, notational conventions of Renaissance polyphony are based on the contus durus divide and by the clefing hierarchies, which form the basis of what we call tonal type. So, that means that the best key to notate something in is not necessarily the best key to sing it in in reference to any particular keyboard instrument that musicians might be singing with. This requires the keyboardist to undertake the mental work of transposing that basso seguente uh, to the best suitable key for for his or her singers uh, that's you know in that in that particular pitch level of that particular instrument. And uh, all, all well and good, this is probably a very local practice that's determined by the pitch level of every individual church. And by the way, there are regional differences, and there's, you're probably familiar already. For example, in German music, we have core tone, comer tone, cornet tone, three different pitch levels. The same is true in Italy. You've got three different organ levels, tuning levels. They each require different transitions. But mm. what seems to have been a really crucial driver in this is, um, remember how I talked earlier about the explosion in uh, psalm composition, psalm and Magnificat mm -hmm. and Benedict. As a result of the Counter-Reformation. It was a result of the Catholic Renewal Movement. So what you now have is you have all of these, you know, young novices who are being pressed into service at the organ bench, and they don't know anything about counterpoint. They haven't studied counterpoint. They're, they're just learning to play basso continuo. But it's like, hey, this is really easy. If we just give you the baseline and you just follow these simple rules, you too can play basso continuo. But they're not necessarily very advanced musicians, these organists. And, and where am I getting this? I'm getting this from the title pages and prefaces of lots and lots of these vocal collections where it says here, for the ease of the organist, we have these transpositions. Now, what's so fascinating is if you look at these people, this is like, you know, um, oh, I, you know, many, many of these collections, Bailey, uh, Conforti, you know, Viadana, etc. You will find sources where the vocal parts are first published in one transposition level, and then the organ part is subsequently published in a different transposition level. And what this tells us, this is so crucial. This is the third stage of that three mode or uh, threefold model. The trans is the translation, the, the transposition, the mapping of vocal tonality onto keyboard, onto a situation in the, on the keyboard. So it's the mapping of vocal patterns onto the keyboard. And what that does is now the keyboard, rather than the gamut, becomes the primary referent for tonal space. And as we and then, as the 17th century goes on, the keyboard eventually is understood to be a circulating entity, and we have the emergence of circular notions of tonal space. So the that is really critical. So that aspect of the of what I call my threefold model is a double shift. It's a shift from prescriptive to descriptive uses of the major and minor scales. And it's also a shift from the gamut to the eventually circulating keyboard as the background um, um, uh, tonal space against which those are mapped. It's a double shift. So that, that explains this. So, I, I like this model because it's very flexible. You, it, it recognizes that once each of these levels is introduced, each of these uh, layers is introduced, first in the Middle Ages, then the Renaissance, then the early Baroque, each of the previous one continues to be at work in music theory. You still have plain chant treatises being written in the 17th century that are propagating old plain chant theory, but you've also got Renaissance stuff going on, and you've got Baroque stuff going on. So it's a complete mess. You look at it, and you just tear your hair out. 
But if you look at it through the lens of this model, it starts to make sense. And you can, and suddenly it becomes a lot, the basic forces underlying these are much more clear.